in God's covenant promises. Walking in God's covenant promises. I have some slides to share. I hope they are ready. And I hope they will come both on the screens here in church and on the Zoom, Zoom uh, channel. I want to welcome all those joining us virtually as well as those who are here physically. But uh, let me go ahead and announce the subject for this evening's study. It is the impact of the promises of God. I've chosen as a topic the impact of the promises of God. It's one thing for us to have promises. In other words, God has promised us so much, but what's what difference is it making in our lives? How can the promises transform our lives? Um, I want us to turn again to Psalm 12, 6 that we looked at on Sunday. Psalm 12, verse 6. It says, the Lord's promises are pure, like silver refined in a furnace purified seven times over. The Lord's promises are pure, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times over. So we have it here on the screen, but we don't have it on Zoom. I must apologize. I'm uh, sending them the slides not in good time, but I would have thought that by now the synchronization would have uh, been done. So let's, let's try and solve that problem while we go to the next, the, next, um, the next slide. Well, I have my own slides here. I want us to recap some things we said last Sunday. Okay, those of us in the house can see um, the recap slide. So first of all, we looked at <coughs> three things about God's promises. Who can remember what they are? This is Bible study, so I, can, I, I, am, I, am, I have liberty to interact with us. And you have liberty to respond. What are three things that we said about God's promises on Sunday? Dependable, deep, and diverse. And with diverse, we looked at three categories of people or what I have called categories of beneficiaries of God's promises. What, what's the first category? Nation of Israel or the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of God. God bless you. In rounding up, I give us three areas of God's promises to meditate upon. I don't know if we've had time to do that, but I mentioned... Promises in three areas. Who remembers what they were? Healing promises, protection promises, and prosperity promises. I want to give us that challenge this evening. Go home and pick three scriptures on each of those areas. So three healing promises. I want to encourage you to pick at least one from Old Testament don't let them all be in one of the testaments because as we learned, all of the promises of God are yea in Christ. So Old Testament promises are yours. So are New Testament promises. Hallelujah. So choose three on healing, at least one from each testament. Three on protection and three on what? Prosperity. Hallelujah. And take time to reflect on them, take time to meditate on them, take, take time to claim them, take time to, you know, what, what we used to use back in the days, appropriate them. Have you ever, I just came back from a trip out of the country, and if you, if you travel anywhere, go by plane anywhere, and you check in luggage, when you get to the other side, your luggage is coming out, isn't it? Now when you see your bag, what do you do? You go and claim it. You don't go and say, ah, now wow. Once you see it's your bag, you do what? You grab it. That's how you should take the word of God, the promises of God. They are yours. They are yours. Praise the Lord. Go and take them. Amen. 
Okay. Now look at the next slide. The, the, the next slide is not there's no slides, unfortunately, for those in Zoom. So let me call out the scriptures. Hebrews 8 6. Anybody here read it? Even if it's on the screen, read it so that those and I want to encourage those um, online to also try and find the scriptures as I call them out. But anybody in the house can read Hebrews 8 verse 6 for us. Hebrews 8 verse 6. It's kind of cut off even on the screen, so I really don't know what, what went wrong. So if you can read it from your Bible, that would be, might be better. It might be better. Yes. Okay, it's come up on Zoom now. God bless you, media team. But now, he, now has he, who is he? Who is he there? Okay, this is Bible study. Let's read it again. Uh, Mary, help us out again. Hebrews 8 verse 6, read it again. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Hallelujah. So, there are two covenants, isn't it? Generally speaking, there are more than two, but let's just take old and new covenants. Who is he in this scripture, if you know the, your Bible to an extent? Huh? Jesus. <laughs> say it now, what's the problem? Jesus, say it, say it you know, with, with boldness. So Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. Jesus has become the mediator of a better covenant than that which God had with the Israelites. Amen. And that covenant is established upon what? Better promises. Isn't that very interesting that the covenant we have with God is established on better promises and the promises that God made to the nation of Israel. So all the wonderful things we read about, some of just we just touched a few of them, or whatever you can read about that God said we'll do for Israel, we have a better covenant established on what? Better promises. Now, if you've been reading your devotional, and I have been reading it, recently we read 1 Corinthians 3.16. Um... 1 Corinthians 3.16. Somebody read for us. I want to look at 1 Corinthians 6.16. But 3.16 talks about how that we are. This was yesterday's reading. Paul says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Now, this, what is on the screen is... Is 2 Corinthians 6.16. But I'm quoting the reading. We're coming to this one, amen. But I'm quoting what we read in the one, one year Bible, the devotional, the Lamb devotional. And uh, I, I really, I'll, I'll actually quote some of it because it's, it's really quite, um, it's awesome. Amen. So this, this covenant that Jesus brought to us unites us with God. Amen. It makes humanity one with divinity. It's, it's an awesome thought, just to even wrap your, your head around it. Now look at the rendering in 2 Corinthians 6.16. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, And what agreement, that's what we have in my slides, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For all of you are the temple of of the living God. Hallelujah. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk. When, when you hear the word I will, when you read I will, what does that mean? That's a promise. Amen? Anyway, in scripture where God is speaking, he says I will, is a promise. God says I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hallelujah. I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God 
and they shall be my people. There are four statements I have on the next slide. First of all, God has promised to live in us. It's an awesome concept. God has promised. It's what he said, I will dwell in them. I will live. Dwell means to live in them, to make, you, to make us his home. God has promised to walk in us. To live through us. To express himself through us. Praise the name of Jesus. God has promised to be our God. I will be their God. And God has promised to receive us. When he says, I will, they will be my people, it means they will be accepted of me. I have received them. If you ever felt rejected, God says, I will be their God. That's your God. And you shall be my people. Praise the Lord. I didn't hear that good hallelujah. Now the promise, this is the promise of the constancy of God's presence. What we find in that scripture is the promise of the constancy of God's presence. I have on the next slide, the statement that the promise of God's presence, going for further, the promise of God's presence is the promise of God's favor. The promise of God's presence is the promise of God's favor. Let's look at the rendering in the, in the Amplified Version of the Bible. The same verse 16, I also read verse 17. Second Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell among them, this amplified, and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17 was where I'm going to. So come out from among unbelievers and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will graciously receive you and welcome you with favor. Amen. So God's promise comes with a promise of what? His favor. God, God's presence, rather, comes with a promise of, of what? Of him receiving us graciously with favor. And favor can make all the difference in any situation. I think it's somebody that said one day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. But let's look at Psalm 44 verse 3. This is Looking at the example of the Israelites, it says, For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your countenance. See, I, I highlighted the light of your countenance. Why is that highlighted? Because the light of God's countenance speaks of God's presence. When you see the things like lift up the light of your countenance upon you, talk about God's presence. Amen? Now, because you had a favor, because you had a favor unto them, so they possessed that land, not, not by their own strength, not by their own skill, not because they were such wonderful swordsmen, but it was what? God's right hand, God's arm, the light of his presence or his countenance and his favor. It was God's power, God's presence and God's favor that gave them the land. Hallelujah. And there are, there are things that have happened to me in my life that told me this is nothing but the favor of God. Sometimes you can ask yourself, is it because of how you look? Maybe there's something that somebody, they saw something on you, like when, we, when I, we got back into the country on Saturday night, 
as we just got to immigration, they have a line. They say Nigerians, other countries. I was going to the, uh, the Nigerians line. And one guy comes and said, no, leave that one and come this way. I said, but this Nigerian line, just follow me, is what the guy is saying. And took me to one other line that's very short. It's, they call that one the VIP line. <laughs> okay. Now, it could be because of my gray hair. I don't know. Or because I came with the family. I really don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's favor. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it might be favor, but I, I don't know. But, but some things have happened to me that I know there's nothing but favor. Are we following what I'm saying? <laughs> One day I was in another local trip this time. I have given this testimony in church. And I bought a trip. I think it was to Enugu Abuja or something like that. Enugu probably. And I was... In my seat, the seat they gave me. Then they we were about to, they have announced, put off your phone, all those kind of things. People in pocket of seat belt. And the, 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 um, the hostess, the air hostess, came and touched me. said, follow me, follow me. I said, ah, what have I done? I followed the guy. Took me, the guy took me straight to first class. I said, I should sit down there. That one I knew was, I was at the very back of the aircraft. Too. <laughs> Maybe the last of the aircraft. I hadn't gotten the gray hair by that time. I didn't have a family, so I said, this one is just God. And I think I even tied that one to the seed I sold. You know, we're having conference, and I packaged all the money I could package. I think it was 150,000 naira seed. And it was a big seed for me that time. You know, but, but God's favor, you know, God will favor you in ways that you know that this is not my own. It's not because I'm, I'm so skilled. Praise the Lord. It's not because of, um, I, you, not that you shouldn't work hard, you should work hard. Not that you don't get, get all the skills, you, but you still need God's favor. Praise the Lord. See, so they got not the land. It was Jerry Savell, man of God who's going to be with the Lord, who said that when you see the word land there, they got not the land in possession. Put whatever you want. They got not the admission. They got not the job. They got not the increase, the, the financial increase. They got not the whatever it is you want. Put it there. By your own sword or your own uh, natural ability, you're not by your own arm, but because of God's right hand, God's presence and God's favor. God's power, God's presence and God's favor is what will give you things. You see, let's depend on God's favor to possess God's promises. Praise the Lord. A lot of things that God is promising us in this season, His favor will help you bring it up. But I want to say something else that the same man of God I just mentioned, Dr. Jerry Savell, on the next slide, he said that whenever you get something by the favor of God, be sure to give him the credit. Don't say, ah, after you knew that God did it, you now come and be carrying shoulder like, you know, you know there's something that you did. No, tell God thank you for what you've done. And if you can, if you have the opportunity to testify about it, this was the favor of God. So God's presence, God's presence, the promise of his presence is the promise of his favor. And we should acknowledge it. When God fulfills promises in our lives, give him glory. When the word of God comes to pass in your life, keep on returning the praise to him. I found it very interesting that one of the most accomplished personages in history knew how to acknowledge God as the promise keeper. Hallelujah. And that was Solomon. We just read recently about the dedication of the temple, maybe sometime last month. And this is Solomon at the height of his accomplishment. He had really fulfilled his life sentence. Whenever you read about Solomon, people talk about it. They said Solomon is the one that built the temple. Amen. In Ezra, they talk about this, the temple built by a great king of Israel. Who? He was reading Ezra. I don't know if we were really reading our Bibles. This was a temple built by a great king of... That was his, his, um, his legacy. And at that point, he says this. At the dedication, you have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. You made that promise with your own mouth. And with your own hands, you have fulfilled it as it is today. They have fulfilled it today. Praise the Lord. God, you made the promise with your... In other words, think about this. Nobody had to tell God what to promise you. 
The God's promises were his own idea. It was, God was the initiator of the covenant of covenant promises. He decided that he wanted you to be, to be prosperous, to be blessed, to be healthy. He, he chose it on his own. He, he decided that he would do this for David. David was not asking. It wasn't even a prayer point. He said, you made the promise to David and you have now fulfilled it. Hallelujah. Now let's go on. He now says in verse 15, And now, O Lord God, you can take something from this. He, he says, um, oh, I've gone back. And now, O Lord God of Israel, Carry out the additional promise you made to your servant David, my father. For you said to him, if your descendants guard their behavior and faithfully follow my law, as you have done, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. There's nothing wrong with telling, reminding God that you have promised this thing. Oh. Amen. When you find those promises, like we said, go and do the search. As you find it, remind God, keep the promise you made to me. Hallelujah. But we see a, a, an interesting dynamic here. It says, for you said to him, and I love the fact that David passed down these details to Solomon. David transmitted the word he received from the Lord to, his, to the next generation. For you said unto him, if your descendants guard their behavior, now look at that word, if. If your descendants do what? Guard their behavior, this NLT, and faithfully follow my law as you have done, as you, David, have done. That's what it really means. One of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. So this was really a conditional promise. But really a conditional promise. And it's really tragic that Solomon actually did not guard his behavior. God just had mercy on David and allowed Solomon's son to and Linear to continue ruling. But he took away the kingdom, really. He gave, gave them Judah and uh, took away the, the entire, the, the larger kingdom from, from David's line. But that takes me to the idea of conditions for the promises of God. In order for us to benefit, and I think Pastor Kenny talked about this last, last Thursday as well, we must appreciate that some promises have conditions. Amen? For instance, look at the next slide. Next slide says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we've heard over and over again that this was not actually written to unbelievers. It's written to those of us who are in the faith but might have missed it. So whether deliberately or carelessly or whatever it was, you did something wrong. Now this is a conditional promise. To receive cleansing and forgiveness, forgiveness we must do what? Confess. Simple. That's the simple condition. Just tell the Lord, I, I'm sorry. I did this and, it's, and I know it's wrong. You know, don't tell yourself that, ah, again, I... I, I I'm not really sure I really did the wrong thing this time because maybe because you've done it before and now you're, you're feeling bad about having to confess it again. God knew about it before you said it. Am I communicating? Yeah, before you confessed it, God already knew. But, you know, it was one other man of God, I think Kenneth Copeland, he said the, 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 the moment you, you confess that sin, God told him that the, the, the day or the moment you confess that sin was not when I found out about it. It was when you got free from it. It was when you confessed. Not that's the one I, I knew about. That's when you got free from it. So this is a conditional promise. We can look at several of them. Many of them have to read financial prosperity are conditional. That's the reality. Many promises that have to do with Christ himself said what? Luke 6, is it 48? Luke 6, what? He says, give... 38. Give and it shall be given. So it's conditional. Amen? The other scripture that we usually quote, my God shall supply all your need. We quote that one a lot and it's a wonderful scripture. When you look at the previous, the verses before that, preceding verse, you see that the, the Corinthians had given an offering of a sweet, not the Corinthians, the, the Galatians, had given an offering of a sweet smelling savor. 
acceptable unto God. Before he says, but my God shall supply all your need. Praise the Lord. All right. Now look at Mark 11, 20, 25. This is our Lord Jesus Christ again. And when you stand praying, Mark eleven twenty five. I'll just read it because of time. And when you stand praying, do what? Forgive. If all of you, if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you. So there are conditions. Many of these promises have conditions. And the one that we are focusing on, which is in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, that assures us of God's presence. It says something. Go to 2 Corinthians, go back to 2 Corinthians 6. I want to read verse 17 now. It says, so come out. Come out from among unbelievers and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will graciously receive you and welcome you with favor. Praise the Lord. Who can read verse 18? Verse 18. Is it? I didn't have that in my, in my notes, but I think it's worthy of reading. That's first Corinthians, Second Corinthians 6, 18. I just read 17. I don't have the slide for, for verse 18. But who has verse 18? Go on. Go on. After the next verse, the verse after that. Okay, is it? Go to nineteen. Is it, no, 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 that verse. Okay, that's the end. Okay, then I, maybe, maybe, maybe go to the next chapter. Let's see what it says. Yeah. Therefore, having these promises, beloved. Go on. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Okay, I thought it was the same thing. I know that it now mentions these promises. Hallelujah. But the promise of his presence must go along with the promise of being separate. And I have on the screen there, be bold. Be bold. Be bold to separate yourself from the world. Be bold to separate yourself from the world. You want to enjoy God's presence and favor? Be bold to know where to draw the line. Amen? Be bold to make a claim for who you are, what you stand for. Amen? I'm a child of God. Let them know. So in 2 Peter 1, and I'll be wrapping up with, with these scriptures. 2 Peter 1, chapter uh, verse 2, says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Actually, I just remember that the senior pastor prayed for, for us when we were traveling, for us to enjoy protocol. So I'm sure that's why I got that protocol in, in Lagos. And actually, we had very smooth, every, every went to about six countries. I've been playing this, this holiday, believe it or not, for about two years. And in everywhere we went to, everything was smooth. Everywhere we went to. Praise the Lord. Anyway, so it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Now, how do you get grace? You know, a lot of us, we hear these things and a lot of Paul's greetings begin with grace and peace. Grace and peace. Who's read his epistles? And scholars will tell you that he also wrote Hebrews, even though he does, he does not announce his name. It's one of the only um, letters of Paul where you don't see his name. But from the analysis, they say it's Paul. Now, in this case, he says that grace and peace can be what? Can be multiplied. How does it get multiplied? Knowledge. Through the knowledge of God. The more you know God. And... The only way we can do that is through his word. Praise the Lord. And obviously through fellowship with the spirit. But we get the grace and peace multiplied unto us. Now verse 3 says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge. See that knowledge again? The knowledge of him that called and hath called us to glory and virtue. 
Verse 5. Oh, verse 4, sorry. That was verse 3. Now, verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these all of you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. So I could have equally called this sermon on teaching the transforming power of the promises of God. God's word, God's promises should transform us. Why it's important to ask yourself, is there any impact of God's promises? In your, because you can have the promises in the word of God, in the Bible, but there, there's no change. But what we are seeing here is that these promises are given unto us that we might participate in God's nature. And that comes about through what we find in my last scripture for the evening, which is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, glory to God, into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, that really tells you that as you meditate, as you focus, as you gaze on... Now, that glass there is the mirror. And if you know New Testament concepts, you know that the mirror is God's word. Amen? The mirror, the Bible speaks about he that heareth the word and doeth it. It's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. That's a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and he goeth his way, forgetting what manner of man he is. And so we need to keep on beholding the manner of man we are in the glass of God's word, the mirror of God's word. We have to keep on looking at those promises that we looked at. God says, I will dwell in you. I will walk in you. I will be your... You have to live like that. Think like that. Amen? And you see that you are being transformed. Those promises we will take... They will, they will, as it were, I don't know how to express what I'm trying to say, but you begin to live it. It, it will become real. Amen. Look at this, what we read yesterday, 7th of August. On, this is on 1 Corinthians 3.16. that says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? You see, this is, this is such, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading the devotional itself now. This is such a profound revelation. It changes not only the way we see ourselves, but the manner in which we treat our bodies. We carry God with us wherever we go. If we carry him, then we carry his power, wisdom, uh, and instruction within us. We can enter any place unafraid and unshaken, confident that the creator of the universe goes with us. Praise the Lord. I want to encourage us to take up. This is just, uh, there's nothing we can do in this month to survey all God's promises. But I want to encourage us to lift up, lift up the promises of God that you find in his word and spend time with, with them. Hallelujah. In conclusion, number one. The promises of God have the power to transform your life. Number two, list as many promises as you can find and just repeat them to yourself. Start by repeating them to yourself. Just start, like there's a scripture that says, you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless your bread and your water. That should be Exodus 23, 25. And I, sh- I will take sickness out of the midst of you. You shall, whatever you want to eat, as you bless your food, God is blessing whatever the bread and water means what, what you're eating. Claim it that as I eat this food, God takes sickness out of my midst. Praise the Lord. So repeat the promises to yourself. If you can 
Write them in your own handwriting. Make confessions out of them. Number three is that where a promise has a condition attached to it, make sure to fulfill the conditions. So number one, realize that God's promises have the power to transform your life. Number two, list as many promises as you can find in the scripture, from scripture and repeat them to yourself. Number three, where a promise has a condition attached to it, make sure to fulfill the condition. It might be a condition of forgiveness. It might be a condition of um, obedience. Make sure to fulfill the condition. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word tonight. Help us, Lord God, to realize how great, how precious, how exceedingly precious your promises are. Help us to embrace them to think about them, to obey your word and fulfill the conditions you have given us so that we can appropriate and walk in these promises to your glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.